All right, let's start by talking about the time skip. After a two year time skip, we finally get reintroduced to all of the characters again. I think the straw hats this time around just look a lot different now. And it throws you in immediately with a hook that after these two years of training, the straw hats are actually deciding to recruit new people to head over into the new world. And so we get to see their attempts as they go around trying to recruit new people. That is until we get these fake straw hats, which look super weird, who just come in and just destroy the real straw hats, which is utterly depressing. I don't think I've ever seen a time skipping handle this way in which the real straw hats, after their two years of training, are immediately just exposed for still being oh so weak. It showcases that strength alone is not going to be the thing that determines whether our Straw Hats are going to be able to go into the new world. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a dumb bit. I think that's as far as I'm going to go with that bit. All right, so I have just finished reading Return to Sabaody, and while it does technically end in Chapter 602, I'm also going to talk about Chapter 603 because it's just way too connected for it not to be part of Return to Sabaody, and it is way too disconnected to be a part of Fishman Island. We good? Okay, we're good. All right, let's start by talking about the time skip. We got to talk about this. We had just finished coming back from a two-year time skip. I think time skips are notoriously difficult to pull off because there are a lot of expectations here. Characters on the one side have to change, but they also can't be way too different. Characters have to have done something during the time skip, but not too much but also not nothing. And honestly, I think One Piece pulled it off pretty well. I don't have complaints about Return to Sabaody. I feel like I should talk about Brooke first because Brooke might be the best character to talk about why is a good time skip. Like Brooke has been absolutely thriving as a musician. So there's a lot that's been happening, right? He's been moving around. He's been performing in different places. Brooke is implied to have done so much just outside of his usual training, right? It makes the world feel alive, which is ironic because he is a skeleton. But also he's just ready to drop it all and come back to this adventure. Zoro, I think, is another beautiful example of this. He was last seen with Mihawk, so he's implied to have uh, trained with him, but he doesn't necessarily have to stay on that one island to do it. While there are some characters that did stay on specific islands, I think this is another scenario where not staying on that one island does bring some really interesting stories. Like, what is the story behind the scar on his eye? I like it because it just implies stories outside of what were shown. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, Sanji is like the, the worst example. I'm sorry, Sanji, this boy hasn't changed much. It's fine. It's hard to be perfection uh, visually, but his tone has changed a lot. This boy is just so down bad. He's struggling out here. Sanji went from being a full on simp to you better lock this boy up because he can't escape out into society. I wasn't ever really that big of a fan of Sim Sanji. Again, I've said that like Boa is just Sanji done right. And so I hope that we can eventually tone him down just, just a little bit, just a little bit. For this arc, you know what? I'm fine with him being like this, right? He's getting readjusted back into society, but like, please stop this man. One of the things that I think this arc does really well, though, is quickly reintroduce a lot of their character dynamics just to see how they would interact together uh, after the time skip. I love Sanji and Zoro's interactions here. I love the brotherly, I hate you, but I gotta stick around because you're gonna get lost if I don't drag you back home kind of vibe. Let's also talk about Usopp, right? He went from an NPC who was trying to be the protagonist to just full on being ripped. Nami also got a lot more confident. I feel like both Usopp and Nami are actually ready for the new world. We got introduced to the fake straw hats, which I'll talk about in a second, but I think Nami and Usopp could just take those guys down single-handedly. And then we got Chopper, who I liked for the most part. He felt like a weird case though, because he didn't recognize that the fake straw hats were fake. I kind of get it. Chopper's more naive. He's looking at humans, which are all pretty weird looking to begin with. It luckily didn't last too long and we managed to steer the character back to normal. Luffy also had that problem now that I think about it. So those are just like the two to three small pebbles in my shoe for this arc. So Usopp and Nami had a lot of really wholesome interactions here. I feel like after missing the crew for just so long, it's nice to finally see them come back together as well as seeing just everybody's outfit swap. 
I felt that even more when Chopper actually got involved. I really loved the body expressions between Chopper, Nami, and Usopp. Some other characters here feel like they've changed a bunch. Like Frankie is entirely different. He has leaned into that robot aesthetic 200%. Now, to be fair, there is some uh, questionable design, right? I love the robot arms. I love the build, but I don't like the fact that he's bald. But it's okay. The hair is not gone forever, luckily. I also like the relation between him and Robin. There's a lot of good dialogue here. I feel like Robin has gotten less of an obvious glow up from the time skip, but there is a really big difference if we compare it to like Alabasta Robin. And lastly, we got Luffy, who I feel like we got to see the least of this arc. And, you know, that's probably fine. The in-world reason is that he's like a really wanted person. And so it makes sense that you would want to be hidden, especially when you're returning to Sabaody. The out-of-world reason is probably because we've had only him for like four arcs. So I'm glad we're giving the rest of the crew the spotlight. You know, it is weird that this is only five chapters. It feels so fast-paced. Like, obviously, Sabaody isn't the best place for a reunion, even when the crew actually finally gets together and everyone's like, oh, you've changed. <laughs> oh no, you've changed a lot more, right? The narrative is still just pushing the characters along here. By the end of the arc, we barely got to see a lot of their dynamics because we're just pushing them forward, which to be fair, makes me a lot more interested in Fishman Island. So I actually want to talk a bit about Return to Sabaody's structure. We have the time skip, of course, and we knew all the characters were eventually going to come back and meet up. But here, we have a twist. And that's probably the best way to explain One Piece's writing style. It is what you would expect, but with a twist. But I like this twist. The twist is that there are fake straw hats that are also on the island to recruit other pirates. And I love this idea. We have two fake Sanjis, but also an entire fake Straw Hat crew, except for Brooke uh, or Frankie, I think. But it's interesting to see the Straw Hats get to a level where impersonation's a thing. And we get to see these fake Straw Hats just commanding and threatening the entire area. What really interests me is that the Straw Hats don't really combat this, and it kind of makes sense. You don't really want to draw a lot of noise to you right now, and if they catch the fake Straw Hats, well, that'd be better for you. The fact that the fakes are taken up by Conqueror's Hockey alone kind of says that they're not strong enough to cause any real damage to any important allies. But I don't know, it's still worth considering that the fakes can still cause a lot of bad PR. On a completely other note, let's talk about Luffy's Straw Hat and the Thousand Sunny. The Straw Hat has just a lot of connections to Shanks, but also to Luffy's own dream. And so it felt really impactful to see Luffy putting it down and delaying himself for two years. The Thousand Sunny equally feels impactful as they both carry the dreams and hopes of the crew. So delaying it and subsequently coming back after the time skip hit even harder. I just think Return to Sabaody is the perfect place to rejoin since there's a lot of similar characters who tried to stop them there last time. We got Robot Kuma who this time around was one tap by Luffy and then again by Sanji and Zoro which just immediately shows their growth. And for as brief as it was, I love that we were shown a lot of these connections that the crew has made during the time skip come on in and help. From Weather Pia to Perona to the Beetle Knight to Silvers himself stepping up and giving the crew time to escape. So if Water 7 was the end of the Naive crew transitioning over into an actual crew, then I think Saba Odi is this pirate crew transitioning over into actually being able to back up what they say and take on the new world. It's a beautiful send off. Luffy's farewell to Silvers is one of the most touching parts for me, not only because Silvers is officially just betting on Luffy, but also because this arc absolutely dropped a bombshell on me. With the Straw Hat connecting Rogers to Shanks to Luffy, it put so much more meaning behind that Straw Hat. Rogers was looking for someone to carry out that dream, and it's made its way to Luffy. Lastly, let's talk about some of the long-term stakes, right? We got the giant Sharingan guy. I don't really know what his name is. He actually begins giving orders to the Marines to be aware of the Straw Hats again, finally putting them back on the map after this hiatus. But for me, it's not what are the long-term stakes. For me, it's what are the short-term stakes. We didn't actually get that many in this arc. 
And that's great. It keeps it short. I think the death of Whitebeard puts a lot of stakes already on Fishman Island, which we already know the crew is directly heading towards. From a storytelling perspective, we weren't told anything about Fishman Island this arc. Even if there's so much happening in this arc, even if it's directly where we're going, it's interesting that there are very close strings that are lightly tugging on the plot, even if we're not told. I love that we just know that something's gonna happen and we're just gonna have to wait for it. Though it's interesting to see that there are also some stakes being built up with a more a dangerous pirate who I'm like 60% sure doesn't actually have this, but 40% sure that I might just be coping right now because I think this new bad guy that's being introduced has the candle wax logia fruit. And if he does, that is really interesting for what happened to some of the other characters we know about. And that's it. Next time we're going to be diving into Fishman Island. There's a lot of things that I'm excited about for Fishman Island. The most important one for me, though, is to hopefully find at least one, at least one Fishman that looks like the Fishman that Luffy drew. If not that, then I'll take like some kind of Spongebob reference. It could just be a sponge there. Look, it's weird. I know it's probably not going to happen, but I've, you don't understand. I've been building this up in my head and I kind of want it to happen. <laughs>